total of announcements we want to draw your attention to, and then uh, some information about Vacation Bible School. Uh, but as we make those announcements, if our uh, athletes will come up and uh, uh, gather our mission committees for us this month, they go towards the Pittsburgh State uh, United Methodist Campus Ministry. They've been here before, and uh, the missions committee is giving us another opportunity to support them. So if you have some loose change or folding money you want to give toward that ministry, uh, you're welcome to do so. Encourage to do that. That's a big help to that ministry. Uh, just a couple of announcements that I want to draw your attention to and then turn it over to Perry Ann and make a few announcements about Vacation Bible School. Uh, you'll notice that up here are the uh, pie in the face contribution jars. This is your last opportunity today uh, because the pie in the face will be given uh, at 1030 this morning. So stick around if you want to see uh, whoever get a pie in the face. I heard that. Ernie Billow was really upset that his money didn't come in like he thought it would. Uh, so we were strongly encouraged to give towards Ernie's uh, fund. It's all great fun, youth a uh, fundraiser for the youth and the work they're planning on uh, later this year. So give as you can if you haven't already, and give heavily to uh, Ernie Billow. That would be greatly appreciated. So do that before you leave, and then hang around until 10 Yeah, and Sam, what is Sam here? Sam is not here. That chicken. Uh, I think I think we ought to contribute more heavily to Sam for that and give it to him some other time. So, um, yeah, where did he go? That's interesting. Well, we want you to have an opportunity to do that. Uh, and it's great fun for the fun, uh, fundraiser for the youth, so uh, help out if you can and hang around. Just look through the rest of those announcements, see where you need to be this week, and that'll be a big help. Uh, and then Mary Ann has an announcement about Vacation Bible School, so if you'll pay attention to that, it's coming up quickly. Thank you, Pastor Ann.
Lord, we are grateful for this day that you've given to us. Though it may be rainy and gloomy outside, it is still a day that you have given to us to come together and to worship you and to honor you for all that you have done for us this past week and days gone by. We give you thanks for this day and this opportunity to come and sing and to join together our voices in our praise. And pray again that what we do here, everything we think, every word we speak, and every action we take part in will be pleasing to you and refreshing for all of us. And we will be careful to give you the thanks. And we pray all of this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and if the children will come up, we'll have some children's time. And while they are making their way up, the usher will be handing out our guest registration uh, pads. You're invited to sign those, and that will be a big help to us each week in the office. So come on down, guys. Come on down. How are you all doing? Are you doing okay? Yeah? Well, I thought I would tell you a story today. It's probably one you've heard a lot, but it's a good story. It's worth hearing. And in fact, I'm going to be preaching on it in just a few minutes, but maybe you can help me tell the story as we go, okay? One day, Jesus was approached by a lawyer, and the lawyer asked Jesus, What must I do to inherit eternal life, to live with you forever? And Jesus said, well, you know what the scripture, what the Bible says. It says that you are to love the Lord your God with what? Remember? All of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. You're to love God with everything. And, Jesus said, you're to love your neighbor like you love yourself. Now, let me ask you here, who's your neighbor? Do you know who your neighbor is? Probably the people that live right next door to you, right? It's more than that, too. And that's part of why Jesus told this story. But the lawyer said, in order to try and trick Jesus, the lawyer said, okay, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told this story. One day a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by some robbers, some thieves, and they beat him up, took everything he had, and left him for dead on the side of the road. And then a few minutes later, a priest comes by, sees the man hurting and bleeding on the road, but he just keeps going. Does not do anything to help him? And a few minutes later, a Levite comes along and sees the man on the road, but he's hurt, but he's bleeding, but he doesn't stop. He just keeps going. And then finally, a third man comes along, a Samaritan comes along the road, and he sees the man, and what does he do? Do you remember this story? He helps him out, right? He gets off his donkey. He cleans the man's wounds, he puts bandages on his wounds, he takes him to an inn, which is like a hotel, and he pays for the man to stay there for two days. Pays his own money for a stranger to stay there two days so he can get better, and promises the guy that's keeping charge of the, of the inn, he'll pay him for anything else he owed him on his way back. And then Jesus asked the lawyer, now, who was a neighbor to that man? You know the answer to that? Which one of those three men was a neighbor to Right, the, the third one, the Samaritan, right? He was a neighbor because he helped. And then Jesus said, you are to go and do the same thing. So that means that you and I have to be neighbors. Jesus wants us to be neighbors to everyone we meet. Not just the people that live next door or our friends or those that are in the church, but everyone. So from now on, whenever we see someone or we meet someone on the street or at the store or wherever, we're supposed to be in their neighbors to help them when they need it. If you see they need help, they help them. You say a nice word if you think they need a nice word. You don't want to love, whatever. But we're to be their neighbors to everyone. And that's kind of hard to do, but that's what Jesus wants us to do, to be everyone's neighbor. Okay? All right, let's try that this week. Right. Let's say a prayer together. Anybody want to say it? You want me to? You want me to say it? Okay, that's what I'll say. It. Dear God, we pray that you would help us to see everyone as a neighbor, that we can help when they need to encourage them, or to give them a hug, whatever. But we pray that you help us to be a neighbor to everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks for coming down. And you do.
Bob Choir of Texas Musician, uh, our, our, uh, our favorite book, which would be the Word of God, uh, indicated to us in, in several passages Jesus was particularly talking about uh, the, the lady brought before him. And uh, I, I know that we're not to use the church service to worship for personal gain. You know, he doesn't like that. I'm going to uh, damage our, our, our check our collateral damage and our losses. I'm going to try to keep them doing this. Please consider that those, he did say, I believe somewhere in the paraphrase, those without pie in their wife's face, let them cast the first meringue. Well, I would that uh, we have had several meringue tosses amongst us, and I not being one of them. <laughs> would you please consider that before we leave today? <laughs> Your donations, all right? I wouldn't say any names. <laughs> Love my shepherd is. Uh, this is our last part of uh, peace for the for the uh, season, and uh, we trust that God will put it on your hearts. Bless you.
Spirit of God, this is our prayer for the day. That as we're gathered here in this place that you called us to be and called us to be a part of, your Spirit would fall on us while we are here and melt us and mold us and use us as you see fit. We come here this morning ready to acknowledge your presence in our lives. You are the one that has brought us here even though we may not know yet why. But you've gathered us here, you've brought us together and welcomed us when we arrive. And already you're working within each one of us, preparing our minds and our hearts to hear your word to us. And so we give you our thanks. You've given us this hour to be together to honor you and to thank you for being God to us. Your love amazes us, your grace always surprises us, and this is our opportunity to come together and honor you with our thanks and our praise. Though it might be weak, and it might not always be the best we could do, we pray that you would help us to offer to you our very best. And every word we speak, and every song we sing, whatever we do here today would be pleasing to you and honor you as our gift for being who you are to us and our opportunity to give you thanks. We pray that you hear our confessions this morning of our sinfulness and our wrongdoing. We know we're not perfect in any way. And often we have failed you and missed our calling. We have ignored you this past week. We have not been the people you've called us to be. And often we have hurt others with our words or our failure to speak words of encouragement. And for all of our sinfulness, we beg your forgiveness. We know that you are a God who is faithful to forgive us when we do confess and we own up to our shortcomings and our failures. And so in the silence of our own minds and hearts, we offer to you our confessions, knowing that you hear us, and knowing in this moment you are faithful to forgive Help us to see ourselves as we really are, in the hopes that we can become the people you want us to be. And we pray that your gift of grace and mercy would flow not just to us, but from us to those around us. When we meet out to someone who has let us down, or we have been spoken poorly of and mistreated in some way, that you give us the courage to forgive to show grace, that they may come to know you better through us, and we may live up to your calling in our lives even better. This morning we give you thanks for the things that you have provided for us, though we are not deserving of any of your gifts. You are a God that loves us and supplies us with things we need and surprises us in the way you act in our lives. For the blessings of everyday life, you've given us the opportunity to serve others, and for that gift, we give you thanks. You've given us the opportunity to reach out and offer words of encouragement. You've given us the beauty of the world around us. You sustain us day by day with the love of our families and our friends. And for all of these things, we give you our thanks. Too often, we forget where these gifts come from. Or we forget to be grateful, or even worse, we think we have deserved them or earned them by our own hands. But we pray that you would remind us of where your gifts come from, that you would make us more aware of them each day so that we might be more thankful and not take these gifts for granted. So give us eyes to see these gifts and a spirit of thanksgiving. We pray for those this morning who are struggling in various ways. Some people we know, they may even be sitting next to us, and some we will never meet. But you call us to be their neighbors anyway. And so we pray for those who struggle. And struggle in ways that we may not even be aware of. But we pray for those who are going through trials of family problems and making ends meet. We pray for those who are looking for work and 
and struggle with finding a job. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones and friends. We remember in our prayers this morning those who are losing a sense of purpose in life, a sense of meaning. For those we know that are grieving and struggling in various ways, we pray that you would be with them and answer their prayers and help them to know that we are praying for them and with them. We pray for those who lead us as we've been taught to do, that they may always look to you for wisdom and insight as they make decisions that will affect all of us. We pray again for your church everywhere, wherever it may be serving, that you will continue to lead it wherever it needs to go, and that it will truly be the church that you have called us to be. We pray for ourselves here this morning, that you would make us aware of your presence that is already here working within us, so that we might give our attention to you and our gifts of song and praise and thanks. We pray that you would renew us and refresh us for the time that we have spent here, and that you would remove anything that stands in our way of hearing you speak clearly to us. Give us clear minds and open hearts. And for all of this, we would be grateful. And for all of this, we pray. And we pray in the name of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, and the one who has taught us all to pray together this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Gospel of Luke. 
Luke chapter 10. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of them, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's bow for a prayer. Lord, again, we are thankful for this scripture that we have read this morning, though it is familiar to many of us. We ask that you would help us to hear it with fresh ears, as though it were fresh this morning. Speak to us clearly what it is you would have us to hear, so that we might become the people you would want us to be. So again, we ask that you would give us ears to hear and minds to understand, and hearts to receive what it is you have for us today, that it may take root in all of our lives and bear fruit, but not just for our sake alone, also for the sake of the world that you've entrusted to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to begin by saying I realize today is Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the church. Uh, instead, of, instead of preaching a, a, a Pentecost sermon, I wanted to look at Pentecost from a different angle and preach on this scripture lesson today, though it's not a traditional Pentecost uh, reading in the, in the lectionary, but I want us to look at it and think of, of this story teaching us how the church ought to be and what the church ought to do. Since we're celebrating the birth of the church, look at it from what we ought to be and do. And I want to begin by telling you a story about a farm boy named Willis. Willis was about 13 or 14 years old, and he and his father had spent all morning loading the wagon with wheat and taking it to market. And they got down the road a ways from their farm, and the wagon wheels hit a pothole in that old farm road, and it knocked over the wagon and spilled all of the wheat onto the ground around it. And there was a farmer living nearby who lived just down the road from Willis's family's farm, and he ran out to hear or see what all that commotion was about, and he saw a young Willis standing on the side of the road looking a bit confused, and the farmer yelled from his front porch, Willis, why don't you come in and forget about all your troubles for a little while and just have dinner with us, and when we're done, I'll come out and help you set your wagon right and reload the, the wheat, and you can be on your way. Willis said, I don't think my father would approve. And the farmer kept pressuring him and said, Willis, we've known your family all of, our, all of your life and much longer. It will be fine. My wife has just set the meal on the table. Come in and eat. And when we're done, I will help you so you can get to market. And finally he gave in. Willis said, okay, but I'm not sure my father would approve. But he went in, had a great meal, a heavy meal, enjoyed it, had some good conversation with the neighbors. And then he got up to leave, and he thanked the, what, the farmer and his wife for this great deal. And again, he said, but I don't think my dad's going to be happy. And the farmer said, speaking of your dad, where is he? And Willis said, he's under the wagon. <laughs> now, Willis and that farmer lived in a different era, of course, than we do. But I think they have something to teach us or something to show us about what it means to be a neighbor to someone else. We all want to be a good neighbor like that farmer. We all want to have good 
neighbors like that farmer. But the idea, the, the definition, the way we think about neighborliness has changed over the years. As our country has moved from country to city, as we've moved from slow foods to fast foods, as we've moved from a dining room or a family room to a game room, our idea of what it means to be a neighbor has changed. And it's only been in the past 20 years, give or take, that a certain feature on homes, new home constructions, has made a reappearance. It used to be that this feature was an assumption. It was included in every new home built uh, around the country, and then it faded away, and now over the past 20 years or so, it has made a reappearance. Anybody know what this one feature is? The front porch. It's a place where we all used to gather and enjoy the end of the day, or gather and watch the world go by and drop by and sit on the front porch and enjoy the evening and the conversation with our neighbors. I mean, my father grew up in a, was born and grew up in a little bitty house in Gleason, Tennessee, and had a wraparound porch, and that's where I learned to fall in love with porches on homes. But they've just now begun to make a reappearance. It's, it's what helped neighborhoods become neighbors were those front porches. But in many new homes, the, uh, uh, the game rooms have kind of replaced uh, those gathering places. The game rooms have come to replace family rooms and dining rooms. Tammy and I watch a show on TV every once in a while, and it shows homes uh, that uh, uh, people are looking at and, and people are having built for their retirement or whatever. And we've noticed over the course of watching this show that the game room is becoming the most popular room in new house construction. Often a game room is twice as large as the family room or a dining room, and often it has replaced the family room altogether. And you know what happens when people gather in game rooms. They don't communicate with one another, right? They communicate to one another through games, but they don't actually communicate with one another. And we've noticed that over the years. People just don't drop in like they used to. Because in many new homes, there's no front porch. Or if there is, it's a small one. And the game room has now become the focal point of, of some homes. And people just don't drop in like they used to. And the truth is, some of us don't want people just to drop in like they used to. Right? We consider that an interruption, an inconvenience. Now, that's not true. For everywhere, of course, I think that depends somewhat on the culture or the, the kind of the uh, spirit of the community you live in. Take, for example, the small, and I do mean small, community of Chatfield, Texas. Anybody know where Chatfield is? Um, you're part of the majority. Chatfield was a small, small community I served as pastor for four years while I worked on my master's degree. It's, it's south of Dallas, north of Corsicana. If you know where Corsicana is, you can drive right by Chapel and miss it. But I mean, it is a small town. Everybody in the community of Chatfield was a member of the Methodist Church. And we averaged on attendance, or in attendance on Sundays, we averaged somewhere between 52 and 57. So we're talking small community, right? It's a great little community, uh, but you would miss it if you just didn't know where it was. Little Chatfield, Texas. But it's a great place. I served there for four years and learned to love it. I learned a lot from that community of Chatfield. Uh, when, we, when I moved there, um, that church, not long after I moved there, celebrated its 150th anniversary. That was 25 years ago. This year, Chatfield will celebrate its 175th anniversary. One of the very few churches that have survived that long. But right after I moved in and got settled, I was getting to know the community, and just across the road, people in Chatfield called it a highway. It was a farm to market road. Um, but right across the highway from the parsonage, which was the parsonage was about half a mile from that little church. There lived a couple who were, of course, members of the church. Their names were George and Dot Hodge. And everybody in Chatfield was related to the Hodge family. 
And that's because the Hodge family had founded that community then 150 years earlier and that church along with it. And they had pictures of the history of the church and all. So George and Donald kind of like the matriarch and patriarch of that community. And I figured if I got to know George and Dot Hodge, who lived right across the road, then I would get to know just about everybody in town. They could tell me the history, they could tell me everything. So a couple of weeks after I got in, got settled, I made my way across the road, walked up, knocked on the front door, no answer. I knew they were home because their garage doors were up and their cars were inside. That's how the people in Chatfield let you know if they were home or not. If the garage doors were closed, they were gone or they didn't want to be bothered. So if they were up, they were home or well. So I saw that. No answer. I knocked a second time thinking, well, George and Dot, they're in their 80s. They're probably a little hard of hearing. So I knocked a little harder and still no answer. And I was getting ready to pound on the front door when Dot Hodge appears out of, from around the corner of the house to my right. She's about five foot nothing and might weigh 75 pounds soaking wet. And she yells at me, Preacher, we've never used that door. They lived there 65 years in that house. We've never used that door. If you want to come visit us, you're welcome anytime. You just come around here, and I followed her around the house. So we, you come around here and you use a back door. You just walk in anytime, announce yourself, and you'll be welcome in our home. You just come right in. So I followed her around. I walked into the back door, which led into their little kitchen. And I walked through the kitchen, and I went into the living room, which would have been the room I entered if I had gotten in the front door. And I sat down. Dot wasn't anywhere to be found. She didn't follow me in. And then I heard George, her husband, say, Preacher, that's what they all call me in Chatfield. Preacher, we don't ever use that room. The only reason we use that room is to get to our bedroom. When we want to visit, we just gather around the kitchen table and we visit there. So I got up and as I was walking out of that living room, I saw the front door that I'd been knocking on about a minute earlier. It had a huge couch pushed up against it. They couldn't have gotten in or out of that house if their life depended on it through that front door. It hadn't been used in 60 some odd years. And I sat down at the kitchen table and learned that's what neighbors do in Chatfield. Just come in the back door anytime you want to come over, just knock and walk in, and you're welcome here. And I sat down and I had sweet tea with George and Doc Hodge, and I got to know a lot about the community there and a lot about what it meant to be neighbors. And then there was that old country store down the road from the parsonage, maybe 50 yards of that. It was an old store, you know, the kind where the screen door opens and it squeaks and it slams shut behind you. And the floorboards in the, in the uh, inside that store were worn slick from decades of people walking on them. And I learned that, that there were a couple of gas pumps out front. You might get gas on a good day from those pumps. You might not. I mean, you know, if they ran out, they ran out. And sometimes the truck wouldn't come. Sometimes it would. So you, you, know, you never left Chatfield without knowing you had enough gas to get back. Because you couldn't get any. You weren't always able to get any in Chatfield. But that old country store, every afternoon, somewhere around 4 o'clock, give or take, every one of the men, or just about every one of the men, it seemed like, in that community gathered at that old store. And they did that just to catch up and to enjoy the conversations and to chew the fat and the you know, And sometimes they might buy a coat and they'd sit around an old card table in the middle of that country store with a, a ceiling fan uh, uh, whirling above them, and they might play dominoes for a little while. I, I uh, played dominoes a lot in Chatfield. Or they might take their coat and go outside and sit on whatever they could find to sit on or lean up against the, the side of the building and they would just enjoy each other's conversation and watch the world go by and catch up on all the news about what's been going on lately. And for all of those years that I was there, four years that I was there, I made my way down to that store almost every day, not every day, but almost every day around 4 o'clock. In all of my visits to that store, I, and it sold just a, 
basic items you might need to keep you from running 20 miles to the nearest city uh, to pick up the basic items. But all the time I went and visited in that store, never once did I hear anybody complain that then, 25 years ago, it cost $2 for a loaf of bread. It wasn't about convenience. It was about community, about being neighbors to one another. So they would sit there in that old store with the fan going, and that's how they would catch up. That was part of the charm of that community. It's one of the things I learned to love about living in Chatfield, Texas. But it was also necessary for their survival, that, that kind of just socializing, that social visits. It's how news traveled in Chatfield because there wasn't a newspaper. Closest newspaper, closest town was Corsicana, 20 miles away, and that newspaper never reported on Chatfield news. So that's how you got together and learned the news. And we know, all of us know, that a phone call couldn't hold a candle to some people's tongues. We all know that's true. In Chatfield, it was true, too, because that's how we learned. When we were sitting around those card tables or outside, that's how we were visiting. That's how we would learn things, as they say in Texas, right quick about who was in the hospital or who was taken to the hospital the night before, whose barn caught on fire last night, or how Miss Mel was doing on her second bout with cancer. She lived right across the road from that old country store. So every time we were together, someone would ask about Miss Mel. And that's where I learned that neighbors have to help neighbors. Neighbors always take care of each other. Even non-church going people have referred to their Christian duty as doing unto others as they want others to do unto them. And we use phrases like what goes around comes around. And I learned in Texas from George Hodge, uh, George Hodge and his brother Persons was his brother's name. Persons Hodge, who was in his 90s when I was there. I learned from those two, it don't matter if your next door neighbor is your enemy. You always help your neighbor. Always. And so you were never surprised living in Chatfield to hear about a bean supper, a ham and bean supper at the little community center just up the road where they were raising funds for some family in the community that had to pay off some unexpected hospital bills or some other fundraiser for someone in the community. It didn't matter if you were a native to that community like George and Dot and Persons or you were a newcomer like the pastor. You always helped your neighbor. Always. Now in island cultures there's a saying that goes like this. The, a good tide raises everyone's boat together. A good tide raises everyone's boat together. In other words, we're all in this together. All this good neighborliness starts with social visits, socializing with one another. It makes for stronger community, a stronger sense of connection. My grandparents would say bad manners if we fail to help a neighbor, if we ignore our neighbor or such a duty as caring for it. You're not supposed to ignore your neighbors, my grandparents would say. And in pre-telephone America, my grandfather never had a telephone until he was 94. He hated it. And he didn't get one until he was 94. We had to teach him how to use it. But in pre-phone America, pre-telephone America, dropping by unannounced was customary, right? It was what people did. It was the custom. It's how we stayed in, in, in touch and caught up with one another. Now, there were a couple of rules I learned about those drop-in visits from people like George and Dot. One is you never stop by during the lunch hour for a morning visit because George might be taking a nap, which I think is sometimes that's the most, that's the holiest thing you can do is take a nap. And George would take a nap. And I learned that unless it was a, a friendly visit, you know, if it was a formal visit, then you were to spend no more than 20 or 30 minutes there. If it was a, just kind of coming and hanging out, you can stay as long as you want. But, but a formal visit, 30 minutes was plenty. But all of that has changed, of course, over time. Even 
those studies have shown us that FaceTime is one of the things that makes us happy being seeing people face to face. We still consider it somewhat of an inconvenience sometimes that people just drop by unannounced. It's almost like an interruption. And outside of small communities like Chatfield, Texas and others, social visits have become all but extinct. Instead, we communicate through technology and it's just going to get this way more and more as we go along. But nowadays we communicate through what? Text messaging, emails, instant messaging, although instant messaging now is fading away quickly. And we use our cell phones to communicate. But when we use those sorts of things, we can't always shake a hand. We can't see other people's faces, read their facial cues, read their emotions, see their eyes. And we can't do any of that unless we visit them in person, unless we treat them as a neighbor. And that's exactly what did not happen in our story this morning. The Good Samaritan. With the priest and the Levite on the road to Jericho, they came across this opportunity to help a stranger, and neither one of them took the time. Instead, they gave the, the wounded man just a glance and a wide berth. They moved over to the other side. Now, granted, the priest was ritually clean. He had to maintain his cleanliness ritually so that he could carry out the duties of the temple and to, to touch or draw near a person who was dead or near death would have made him unclean and prevented him from going about his priestly duties serving God in the temple. The Levite who comes by, and, and, you know, he, he gives a look, but instead of doing anything to help, he also passes by and does nothing. Now we, it has often been assumed that most scholars will tell you that the man who was beaten and robbed was in the, even though it's a fictional character, he was Jewish. And so was the priest and the Levite, of course. And here's the kicker. That means that both that all three of those characters, the priest, the Levite, and the robbed man, were of the same community. But those two refused to help their neighbor. Refused to give him a, a helping hand. It would be like when you and I would travel to some exotic place like Cairo or somewhere overseas like, like Cairo and, and you come across another American citizen who has fallen on his luck and is having trouble and you see him there. It doesn't matter at that point if you're a Republican from Texas or he's a Democrat from Massachusetts. You help that neighbor because you're of the same community. But you choose not to and you learn later that some kind friendly Muslim family took him in and paid for his well-being until he could get back on his feet. It's the same scenario as Jesus sets up. The priest and the Levite both refused to do what was right. They'd been given the chance, but they didn't do it. And their misunderstanding of what it means to be in, uh, in service to others, it trips them up. It gets in the way of their compassion and their humanity and even their faith. They fail to act. They fail to see. They fail to feel. They turn their faces and they walk away. And they didn't just turn their other cheek. They turned their backs on someone who needed their help. But the Samaritan comes along and he stops to help. He puts in face time with a stranger. He stops to help. Jesus telling us the story shows us that the Samaritan behavior is what Christian behavior ought to be. He stops, he gets off his donkey, he uses his own olive oil to clean out the wounds, he uses his own wine as an antiseptic, he binds up the man's wound, he puts him on his own donkey, he leads him to an inn where he stays the night with him, then he gets up the next morning, he pays two days wages, for the innkeeper to allow him to stay there and recover, and if he owes him anything more, he promises he'll pay him back on his return trip. All of this for a man he does not even know, has never seen before, is not his neighbor until that moment when he needs him. I love the story about a school teacher, a Sunday school teacher. She's 
has a class of fourth graders, and she's telling them this very story in her own words. She's telling him, telling her class this story, and she uses vivid detail as much as is appropriate so they can see the drama and get an idea of what really is going on. And when she's done with the story, she asks the class, what would you do if you saw a man lying on the road, beaten and bloody and half dead? And one little girl spoke up and said, she, I would probably throw up. We probably would throw up, but we might give up. Being a neighbor means taking chances by visiting with someone who's not like us, who does not run in our social circles, or lending a hand to a stranger, or making eye contact in the checkout line at the store. It might even be saving someone's life. What would it be like if we began to learn our faces, our, our neighbors' faces and lives? If we began <coughs> behaving like neighbors with others? That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. That's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. We might say we are willing to help, but often we do not. We might say it, but we fail to do anything. And too often we don't do anything to help. We may see a need, but we don't make an effort like the Samaritan to get off our donkey, bend down and offer help, and words of encouragement. And the victims of the world are just waiting for us to drop by and stop in and spend some time. And the fact is, anything less means we have failed at our mission. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we have not always been a good neighbor. Even to those we know who live next to us, but especially to those we will never meet and may never get to know. Forgive us and help us from this day forward to live as a true neighbor to anyone who needs a neighbor. And we'll be thankful that you could use us. And we pray it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
declare. We believe in one God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 413, a charge to keep my hat. If you'd like to come and spend some time in prayer here at the altar, we'll recommit your life in Christ or we'll give it for the first time. This would be a great time to do it. And as we sing, 413. Let your light so shine that others might see your good. 